The Rebel Capitalist Show. All right, guys, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome someone back to the Rebel Capitalist Show. He is my good buddy and Fed guy, the absolute Fed insider, Joseph Wang. Joseph, welcome back to the show, my friend. Hey, George, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. All right. Now, let's talk about reverse repo. I want to do like a, a deep dive to start out. And uh, specifically, kind of how I'd like to break this down is I'd like to look at it from the standpoint of the Fed and kind of their rationale for setting this up. I, I don't know that everyone knows that. And then I'd like to look at it from the position of a money market fund. If they've got, let's say, a billion dollars, and what are their options? You know, what are their options? Just lay them out. You know, let's say they've got three or four different options there. And then let's try to think through what would prompt them to use reverse repo opposed to or instead of some of those other options they have. And let's keep going. And I think that'll help people really get their head around what's going on and maybe some of the potential uh, scenarios that could play out or some of the potential motivations that's driving the repo going over two trillion. Reverse repo. Sounds, sounds good. Sounds good. Let's do it. Okay. So from the Fed standpoint, why, why did they even set up the, rever, the reverse repo account? Or I don't know if it's called the, a, a standing facility, like the repo facility. Facility. is it? It's okay. called, yeah. So the way that, so the, the primary purpose of the reverse repo facility is to control rates. So, you know, the Fed, they have a mandate, right? So full employment, price stability. And the way they go about achieving this is by controlling interest rates. But, you know, how do you go about doing that, right? Well, the reverse repo is how they go about doing it. So at the end of the day, the reverse repo facility basically offers a way for private investors to lend risk-free to the Fed. Okay, so now this is important in, in for interest rates because suppose you're an investor, right? You have you know, a billion dollars, and you want to invest it. Now, you can invest it overnight with the Fed risk-free, let's say for 1%. Okay, let's, let's do that. And then let's say the Fed promises you that, you know, I'm going to keep the reverse repo facility at 1% for one year. Then when you hear that, then immediately you can see, you can think, okay, well, I can lend overnight to the Fed every day at 1%. Or how much would I be willing to lend at for six months or 10 months or one year? then it's all 1% then, right? Because my alternative in lending one year is to just lend every day to the Fed overnight at 1%. Right. So once the Fed is able to set that reverse repo rate and tell you, guide you as to what that rate would be in the coming years, it immediately gets priced into the treasury curve as the risk-free rate. Because an investor has the option of either lending every day overnight to the Fed at this you know, projected rate path or lending, let's say, in a one-year, two-year, three-year frame. Thing. So the reverse repo the floor. That sets the floor. That is that is the primary mechanism which interest rates are implemented in, right. in, so, in the financial system. Yeah. So basically, let me just kind of explain that. So let's just say you're a money market fund manager. You, you've got two options, or let's just say that you're someone with a billion dollars. Uh, you've got two options. You can lend it to the Fed completely risk free. Let's say one percent. Right now, maybe eighty basis points. Or you can lend it to your buddy. Joe Bob uh, for 50 basis points. What are you going to do? Exactly, <laughs> you're going exactly. to lend it to the Fed because who knows if Joe Bob is going to pay you back. And so why would you charge Joe Bob or why would you get a lower rate of interest from Joe Bob where there's higher risk, right? Exactly. So obviously you'd send it to the Fed at, at risk free and that sets a floor because no one's going to lend at a lower rate, theoretically. Exactly, exactly. That's how it would work. And you could extend that just beyond the overnight to one or two years, because the Fed, they give, you, they give something called forward guidance. So they'll give you an idea of what the overnight rate will move to towards the next few months, few years. And so based on the exact same logic that you talked about, George, you can think, well, what, how much would I be willing to win, lend someone for a term of one year or two years, right? Well, you know, I, I think the Fed will hold the overnight risk-free rate you know, along this trajectory, then you can kind of shape your expectations. So, okay. So let me throw you a quick curveball, Joseph, before we go any further. Uh, so why would anyone lend to the government for under that rate? Because correct me if I'm wrong, but the four week uh, T bills trading under reverse repo. That's a really good question. Uh, the reason is there just the there's frictions in the plumbing. So the fed, right. 
in order to invest with the Fed, you have to be a Fed counterparty. And not everyone can do that. Like me and you, I can't invest at the Fed, right? right. <laughs> money, <laughs> only, only money market funds can do that and some other people. So let's say that you are overseas, uh, you know, let's say huge dollar fund overseas in Japan, you have extra cash. Okay, I can't access the reverse repo facility. So what do I do? Well, the next best thing is to lend in bills. It's going to be below the RRP rate, but you know that's 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 the best you can do. And okay. there's actually another another way to think about this. Um, even if you are a domestic money manager, let's say George, you have ten billion dollars and you have you want to put your cash somewhere, um, you can give it to a money fund to put it in the RRP, but that money fund is going to charge you a management fee. It could be 30 basis points. It could be 50 basis points. Uh, right. So you're sitting you're sitting in your office saying, I can give the money market fund money and it'll give me the, and they'll put it in the RRP. Let's say the RRP is, you know, 80 basis points like it is today. They're going to take 30 basis points off that. I'm going to get 50. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you know what? Might as well just buy bills myself. So yeah, exactly. It's, I, it's I, not, it's not I don't necessarily want... rice, right? Yeah, I don't want to get too advanced, but I'd like to get your take on on we'll just keep it very basic uh, Snyder's theory or idea that one of the main reasons you see the T bills trading under reverse repo is because there's incentive for a lot of these financial institutions to have those treasuries on their balance sheet for balance sheet management. So they're willing to pay a premium for that. So I think there are some firms that would like to have treasuries on their balance sheet. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think they have to be bills. They could be just uh, tre any other treasuries because treasuries under the regulation are considered to be risk-free okay. assets. Um, but I, I think of what's happening in the bill market more as supply and demand. So, you know, it's like any other item, any other business, right? Supply and demand. So the treasury is cutting bill issuance significantly. So. Um, the way that this works is that the Treasury you know, issues debt for the U.S. government, and but it can have a choice as to whether it should issue longer dated, um, say, debt like coupons, 10 year, 20 years, or shorter dated debt like bills. Usually they issue bills to manage their cash, but what happened in April was that it had enormous amounts of tax receipts higher than expectations. Remember, we're in an inflationary environment and right. the tax brackets don't rise as much as income. So the US Treasury collected a whole bunch of cash. They don't need as much cash, so they're cutting their bill issuance by about, I think, 450 billion this quarter, and they're gonna cut another 150 billion next quarter. So that decreases the supply and you know that pushes bill yields lower. But yeah, but it, it, in my view, if you just think back to that, that framework where you're a cash investor, you can invest in a money market fund or buy bills, it's not necessarily that they're on, you know, mispriced because you have to keep in mind the money market fund charges like 30, 50 basis points. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. So uh, going back, so the, the Fed set this re or set up this reverse repo facility in order to put a floor on interest rates. That was the yes. idea. Yes. Uh, so, and how long have we had this since they started doing quantitative easing? That would be my guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it it, it mops up a lot of the extra money that quantitative easing. Yeah. So done. prior to two thousand eight, let's say they didn't have this reverse repo facility set up. No. Yeah. Okay. So that I just want to make sure that everyone understands that the system, uh, let's just call it the the domestic dollar monetary system, was significantly different prior to the GFC than after the GFC, especially when you're looking at it through the lens of the Federal Reserve. So, exactly, we, okay. Exactly right. There's a sea change in how everything works. So, um, you know, if, if you were actually trained in the prior regime, I think you would, it's actually probably a liability since so much has changed. So yeah, the, the fulcrum interest rate is the RRP rate. That's the, that's the minimum rate that the risk-free risk rate that the Fed sets. Right. Okay. So now let's look at it from a standpoint of a money market fund. Well, first of all, um, what entities have access to reverse repo? I know the majority of the transactions are money market funds, but there are other entities that have access that are maybe, uh, are they just banking entities? Like, or do hedge funds? Are there certain... So uh, as you mentioned, you're absolutely right. Almost all the money is from money market funds. Um, right. Actually, there's... Uh, I think maybe close to 90%. So the remaining, the remaining bit 
is GSEs, and I'll, I'll talk about them in just a moment, and also uh, dealers. Dealers are like, uh, you know, they're like people who, they're like your broker, they buy and sell securities. So uh, they're a very small part though. Okay. Um, banks banks don't participate in the reverse repo facility because they get interest on reserves, right? And that's higher than the RRP. So if you're a bank, you know, you, if you could get like, let's say 1% and the RRP would be lower than that. So a GSC has an account at the Fed, but they don't get IOR. So I didn't know that. Yeah, they don't get IOR. Okay. Um, that, so for them, you know, the RRP, oh, that's an, it's a good deal. I otherwise they get nothing at the Fed, so I, I might as well go to the RRP. And the GS, major GSEs are Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the Federal Home Loan Banks. So okay. let's say so, that. And right then you now, said the money market fund ninety percent. Uh, oh. So uh, uh, roughly 90%, I, I forget the exact number, but it's overwhelmingly money market funds. Okay, got it. So, so you're a money market fund manager. You've got a billion dollars. What are your options? Okay, so since you know, we're getting into the weeds in this, I'll be a bit, a bit more specific. So in the money market fund space, broadly speaking, there's two types of funds. Okay. There's called prime funds who can invest in uh, assets that are that have credit risk and there are government funds and then there are also treasury funds okay so let's say three types and this is by the sec's classification the prime funds they can invest in let's say uh, bank deposits right so they can actually lend to a bank a cd that they would like to do they do that so um, the government money market funds can only invest in credit risk-free stuff however that includes more than treasuries that also includes agency debt. So if Fannie Mae issued some debt, they could buy that as well. Now, Fannie Mae isn't part of the government, um, but because people believe it's backed by the government, it's credit risk-free. So okay. they can buy that as well. Okay. And then you have the treasury funds and they can either only do treasury, buy treasuries or do treasury back repo. Within that, there's also a small subset called treasury only. They're like ultra pure and they can only buy bills only bills not even treasury repo that's that's too dangerous for them and so they also can, they can buy i just want to be very specific they, they can actually buy treasuries or they can execute a repo or lend out cash as long as they get those treasuries as collateral okay so the treasury the treasury money market funds can only buy treasuries or okay. lend money back with treasury securities okay within a small subset of the treasury only fund of the treasury group is a, is a type of fund called the treasury only fund. They won't even lend money and take treasury collateral. That's too risky for them okay. because they don't want to have the counterparty risk. They can only buy treasuries, which basically means they can only buy bills. And okay. they are part of the reason why bills trade um, so much below the RRP as well, because these people, they got to buy them. They're not a big, they're not big, but you know, they, they matter as well. Okay, before we go on, I, I want to, one thing I, I want to ask before I forget is, I know in the normal repo market, let's just say the, the, the private market or the free market there, yep. when an entity gets that treasury as collateral, they can go ahead and use that uh, treasury, let's say for other purposes, whether yes. you want to call it rehypothecation or, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yep. But my understanding is that when an entity does a transaction with the Fed as a counterparty and they get collateral, they cannot take that treasury and do anything with it. They can't rehypothecate the treasury. So if you want to look at a collateral multiplier, the collateral multiplier would be far lower if that entity is getting their collateral from the Fed as opposed to the normal repo market. Is that correct? So you actually, you can hypothecate, but you don't in practice. The reason is because the money funds cannot, and they're the people who participate in the RRP. So they okay. get the collateral, but they can't do anything with it. So it just sits there. If a dealer lent into the RRP and they got collateral, they can actually move it within the tri-party platform. And this okay. is super, super in the weeds, but it, it is possible to do it. In practice, people don't do it though, because you know it's all money funds and it just sits there. Okay. so. Moving on or discussing or diving deeper into the topic of the collateral multiplier, is there any way you can measure that? And is that a measurement potentially, if you can, is it a measurement or a proxy for counterparty risk in the system? 
So when you, when you talk about collateral multiplier, so there's there's two people who talked about this. One, I think a, a few years ago, maybe a decade ago, was there's a guy at the IMF, he's called Mohammed Old Singh, and he wrote a paper showing that the banks have a lot more repo on their books than they they do collateral. So he's thinking that, you know what, this this collateral is being moved around a lot. And right. that's one thing. And there's a newer set of research by a couple of economists at the Fed's Board of Governors. And what they're measuring is, is, it seems to me more like what's called matchbook repo. It's going to be a different concept from what um, Mohamed Osing, uh, I know I'm not pronouncing his name correctly. That's oh, okay. That's okay. He, 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 that, then what he's doing. So I, I think of that. So when I think about Kairu hypothecation, I think of it more as just how treasuries and cash are fungible and how cash moves through the system. So the predominant rehypothecation that happens today is simply what's called matchbook repo. And this is how it works. So let's say, George, you're a money market fund, right? You have a billion dollars. You want to lend it. Okay, so I'm a hedge fund. I want to borrow a billion dollars. And I have treasuries to put up as collateral. What do I do? So I don't actually don't know you. And I, you know, I don't have time to meet your money funds. And trust me, you're a money market fund. You won't want to lend to a hedge fund. So the way that this works is that the hedge fund calls up a dealer and says, hey, I want to borrow money and I have a treasury. Okay, the dealer says, okay, let's do it. So I give the dealer the treasury and dealer gives me money. Mm. But where does the dealer get the money? The dealer takes the collateral that I gave him, the treasuries, he turns around and he calls you the money market fund. And he says, hey, I want to borrow money and I have collateral. So he takes the collateral that I gave so I pledged the collateral to the dealer. The dealer turns around, pledges it to you, and you give him the cash. And that's how cash, that's the space that, that's basically the reply to application there. Um, so it, it's basically just how money moves as if a collateral moves through the system as if it's cash-like. Um, I think in the pre-GFC, you could do you would do this with things that are not uh, risk-free assets, and that becomes a problem because eventually maybe well they used to be risk free joseph <laughs> yeah the abs's were all risk free prior to the gfc didn't you know that <laughs> yeah yeah and, and all the triple a stuff and suddenly it's not risk free and then oh my gosh i'm okay. stuck with stuff that's not what then i have losses and then right. if i have losses you know then you know things kind of spiral out of control because then I can't repay my loans and so forth. But if if you were all doing this with treasuries as, as we basically are these days, it's a lot safer. Um, and, and the collateral chains, as you would call it. So whether or not you are able to repledge that to someone else are, are shorter today. And because they're shorter and because they're mostly treasuries, things are a lot safer. Um, but it requires other... more collateral though, doesn't it? Um, Wouldn't it require, because I always think of it as, as kind of, you got this pie or pie chart yes. or whatever. And if we had all these quote unquote risk-free assets that included uh, asset-backed securities, that included mortgage-backed securities, that included T-bills and all these, I used on my whiteboard videos, I used to call it oceanfront property in Arizona or all this, you know, all this they just threw anything in there. Oh, it's yes, risk-free, yeah. no problem, right? Um, but then you go to the GFC and all of a sudden we say, or we, the, the monetary system says, okay, all this stuff that we were using as risk-free is no longer risk-free. Therefore, I mean, technically the amount of collateral would just be like cut in half. So, uh, you know, I don't know, whatever the percentage. No, 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 that, that makes sense. Substantially. Yeah. So then how does the global monetary system uh, function at the same pace? Well, in order to do so, it's temporarily going to need a lot more dollar liquidity, which I think is why the Fed, I don't know if they even realized they were doing this, but why they had to take their balance sheet through QE from, you know, 800 billion up to 3 trillion uh, really quick because they're kind of filling that gap. And then the government has to come out. And again, I, I don't know if they're even cognizant of this, but they have to run these huge trade deficits or excuse me, uh, huge budget deficits to supply the global monetary system with the collateral needed because this collateral multiplier, or well, first of all, because the collateral in the system was dramatically reduced 
And then also because that multiplier might've been reduced as well. Is there something to that theory or that idea? No, no, I, I think that's absolutely right. So you had in you had basically what everyone thought was, was safe assets. Like everyone needs safe assets. For, for you and I, it's money we put in the bank. If you have a lot of money, it's probably treasuries. And back then it was all those other things you mentioned as well. All that just kind of got haircut. Mm. You know, so you had a tremendous, tremendous decline in uh, money or value, so to speak. And the Fed came in and tried to fill that demand for money. And that that I think that that makes perfect sense. And I think since the Fed Bernanke was at the helm then and he kind of studied what something similar happened in the Great Depression, that's probably what he was thinking in his in his head when he went and did quantitative easing. So I I always try to think okay, where does that put us now? And, and kind of what's the end game here if that is in case what happened? Because I think, all right, well, if the Fed's balance sheet basically plugged this hole that we had in collateral, uh, the only way, and correct me if I'm wrong, the Fed can take their balance sheet back down to 800 billion is if the, the uh, government uh, debt to GDP goes up to, or, or the, the, the government total debt, let's say, goes up to what, you know, 50 trillion? It's, it's at 30 right now because, the, again, the system, in order for the Fed to bring their balance sheet back down to quote unquote a normal level, we would have to have all a ton more collateral, assuming that that, call it the euro dollar system, was functioning at the same capacity it was functioning in 2007. Do you see a different path to, to get the Fed's balance sheet back down to quote unquote normal levels? I, you know, I, I don't think the Fed can ever have like a small balance sheet. So I'll, I'll look at it this way. So the transition from the GFC world to today is not just an increase in the quantity of liquid assets, but what qualifies as safe assets. Back then, you could have the private sector create them. Since then, you can only have the public sector create them, right? Everyone either holds treasuries or has balances at the Fed. And the Fed accommodated that by increasing their balance sheet. Because they are accommodating this and because they force everyone to only hold Fed assets as safe assets, it has to stay large. Um, whether or not that's enough for the system, I, I actually think the way that I think, I think it is right now, and I don't actually worry there not being enough because we just issue so much, we, there's so much deficit spending that the treasury balances grow a lot every year. I, I actually think the concern for me is that we eventually have so much safe assets that you know people see that they're not really safe because they become very volatile and you have inflation kind of erode them away mm -hmm. such that, I mean, if you look at the long bond, for example, or even the 10 year, they're having equity like returns. That's not really what you would expect of a safe asset. So uh, for me, I, I, I don't worry that the world, I mean, will not have enough safe assets because the Fed is shrinking its balance sheet. I worry that safe assets become less safe. And then what will happen to, to the financial system? You know, we force everyone to hold treasuries because they're safe. Um, but, you know, they seem to be declining a lot in value. How safe were they in the 1940s? Ah, I wasn't around then. <laughs> well, but, but, you, but you know my yeah, point I, there, right? Yeah, you're, yeah, holding, yeah. you're holding treasuries as a quote unquote safe asset. And the Fed has the peg, uh, the yield curve pegged at well, the, the long end, I think it was 2.5% or something. And you get a 1947 where the CPI goes to 19.5%. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, I mean, meaning they're not safe because you're getting smoked on your purchasing power. Yeah, you're getting smoked on your purchasing power. And unless you have it pegged, you're going to have nominal losses as well. So not just inflation eroded, you know, losses. Right. So, right. so you, um, that's when you're saying, I just want to be very clear here for the listener and the viewer. When, when you say uh, risk assets or uh, risk-free assets could start having quite a bit of risk or safe assets could be maybe not so safe, you're, you're saying that because if we get a, a significant amounts of inflation continue to get that, then the interest rates go up, the price of those safe assets goes down. So you take, or the holder takes a significant loss in just the, the price of, uh, you know, a, a capital loss 
but then also you're losing money in the form of purchasing power because inflation is dramatically exceeding the rate of interest you're getting on that bond. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, if you look at TLT, for example, just I think that's what a lot of people look at for bonds. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it's a waterfall for this, this past year. And that's not what you would expect for a safe asset. So now it seems like the safe asset really is just cash or stuff you hold in the bank because at least it's not declining in nominal terms. Yeah, but it's declining in real terms. So, you know, that's yeah. unsafe. It's, it's, I've always told people on my videos that we're not living in 1981 where you can just buy the, the long bond and, and just kind of set it and forget it, no problems. You know, investing, I'm sure back then was uh, very difficult, but I don't think it would be near as difficult as it is today because you've got uh, not only so many more variables, but mm -hmm. there is nothing that you can hold that's just quote unquote safe. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of risk in everything, even cash. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, oh, unless you buy oil, it seems to do really well these days. <laughs> unless you buy what? Oil, that seems to be oil. doing really well. Yeah, I think that we're in a commodity super cycle, but I, I, let's get back. I, I know I really went off on a tangent there. I apologize. So we were talking about, like a half hour ago, we were talking <laughs> about the money market funds and, and what their options are. And you broke it down by specific money market funds because there was nuance there that I was overlooking. So now let's get back to that topic and figure out, okay, so with those, I think there were three specific money market funds. Uh, what can they, what are their options? Yep. So if you're looking at the prime funds, their options are basically anything in the money market space, uh, which is to say anything that matures within 397 days. So they can do repo backed against, uh, you know, treasuries or agencies. You can buy CDs, you know, so they can buy you know, certificates of deposits. They could do like a term deposit. They can also buy treasury bills, things like that. So that's actually in practice what they do. Um, and they can also invest in the RRP, of course. Um, the, the truth is that the, the extra yield that you get from let's say lending to a bank, which is what you do if you buy a CD, isn't that great because the banks don't really need that money either. So mm -hmm. the prime funds don't offer a whole lot of extra return compared to the government funds. And they're kind of a dying breed. So. Um, like before 2016, I think the prime funds had about um, around $2 trillion. And then something called money market fund reform happened. And money market reform, what that is, is that it basically meant, it is basically a new set of rules to try to make the prime funds safer. So prime fund is kind of like a bank, if you think about it. You put money into the prime fund, which you think you can withdraw any other time, anytime you want. But the prime fund is investing in assets that have some credit risk. So there is some possibility that you go and you ask for your money back and it's not there. That's what happened during Lehman. One big prime fund invested in Lehman Brothers, lost a whole bunch of money. Everyone was scared. All, their, all his investors were scared and they tried to get money out. So, you know, that was a classic bank run situation. So the prime fund had to sell its assets to get the money to repay its, its investors. And that resulted in um, you know, because they were selling at fire sale prices, it resulted in losses. And so it was kind of a classic bank run situation. Now, in order to prevent that from happening again, money market fund reform said that prime funds have the option of gating redemptions. So that means that if you're an investor in a prime fund and you want your money out, the prime fund can say, no, sorry, mm. can't give you your money back. Okay. So that was intense. So, okay. So from, from the policymaker thinks that, hey, if we do this, then there won't be any panic. There won't be any panic, right? So we can shut the redemptions down so everyone cools their head and things get better and then there's no more panic. So that's what they're thinking. What actually happened is that all the investors saw that the prime funds would have these redemption gates and they're like, oh, my, that means that when I need my money the most, I won't be able to get it. Exactly. That's, that's a deal breaker, right? Because if you're an investor in a prime fund, you have invest sometimes you have investors too. If I'm a big hedge fund, I have extra cash, I put it in a prime fund. Right. Now, if something happens in the markets, hedge funds investors, I'm a hedge fund, my investors want their money back. So I go and try to get my money out of the prime fund. 
if the prime fund says you can't get your money out, then I'm stuck. I have to go and try to fire sell assets that I'm in trouble. So the prime funds, um, they basically, the, the investors moved a trillion dollars out of prime funds and into government funds. And since then, the prime fund complex has shrunk significantly. So they're, they're kind of a small player. I think they have about $600 billion left. So it, it's, it's much smaller. Um, uh, the total money market fund universe today is about five trillion. So it's, it's, they're, they're much smaller. Um, the government funds are the largest part of the money market space because, well, they're credit risk free and they have a wide range of options. They can invest in debt issued by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, home loan banks, as well as by treasuries and do treasury repo or agency MBS backed repo. And that's what they do. Now, do uh, those just, I'm, I'm sure the viewers who uh, have a money market fund are, are wondering, can those uh, people pull their money out at any time? Yes, they can. They okay. can. They can. So there's no gates there. That's what makes the government money funds attractive. So, you know, that's super important, right? I need to get my money out uh, when there's a crash. So, yeah. And okay. the last category is for the people who are just ultra, ultra conservative. It's the treasury only funds. It's for people who think that, you know, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Back in, back in 2008, they were on the brink of bankruptcy and they got bailed out by the treasury, right? I don't even want to take that kind of risk. Now, to be clear, it's been proved that the federal government will back Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, so their debt is basically risk-free. But if you want to be uber cautious, then you can just invest in the treasury funds because they only invest in United States obligations. So why would you do that instead of just buying the treasuries themselves? Is it because you've got just a little bit of... Uh of interest rate risk on the treasuries? Uh, Meaning if you buy a treasury and you have to sell it before the maturity, you know, you could have a capital loss there. Uh, are you talking about an invest? Why would an investor invest in a money fund as opposed to buying treasuries themselves? Or are yeah, you- Why would someone buy, uh, why would someone invest in the treasury money market fund that can only buy treasuries? Okay. Uh, as opposed to just buying the treasuries themselves, because I'm assuming you're going to have to pay the fund manager a little, a couple of yeah, points. because you don't want to manage it yourself. So yeah, okay. it's, it's convenient, right? You, you, you just got to put your money in like a bank deposit and take it out whenever you want. You don't have to actually go to the auction to buy stuff. You don't have to actually roll. You don't actually have to make sure that, you know, look through the curve and try to find value. What's mispriced, mm. maybe get a little pickup. So it's just for the convenience. Okay, um, great. Yeah, and if you're a big fund, if you're really big, you would manage your cash yourself, like a corporate treasury. But if you're small, it makes sense to just pay someone to do it. Okay, so I guess then it's safe to say that uh, of the 90% going into reverse repo, pretty much 100% of that is from this middle category that the government funds. It's the vast majority is from the government funds. Um, the, I mean, the prime funds will participate as well, but they're small because they, they're just a smaller part of the space. The treasury okay. funds will also participate, the ones that can participate in repo. The only ones that will not participate are the treasury only funds because they cannot. But you're right, the, the vast lines here are the, what's called the government funds. And they're, they're just, you know, I think most recently it was almost 2.1 trillion and it's gonna go much higher. I expect it to go to 2.5 and maybe 3 trillion by the end of the year. Okay, so why would that type of money market fund manager choose to, to use the Fed as a counterparty as opposed to uh, another entity in the, in the private sector? Oh, let's they, say. Want, they want to go to a private ent entity. So they want to go to say, let's say JP Morgan, I want to lend you money in the real Because I'm assuming they, they get a few more basis points, right? No, they don't get any basis points. So, so that's why they use the Fed because the, there's no spread, right? Uh, if there were spread, they would go to the, uh, but even if there were no spread, they would still go. That, that's what you want to keep in mind. It's a relationship business. Like we're, we're friends, like the dealer and the money fund, they go way back every day. They go way back. They, they deal with each other. If the money fund can get like, say, this, uh, 80 at the RP and yeah. JPN's offering 80, they're going to go to JPN just for the oh, relationship. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I, I assumed it would be the opposite. So I wasn't thinking through the personal relationship component. Yeah. So you have to so the way that this works is that a money fund so is always shopping to to invest in repo and sometimes you know shit happens maybe they get a whole bunch of inflows and they have money they don't know where to put 
if you have dealers or friend, hey, you know what? Maybe I could help you out a little bit. So you, you have to, you're like there for each other, right? And sometimes the dealer needs extra money and the money fund can give them some extra money. So they have a relationship that they maintain and that goes you know, for years for a long time. So, but here's the thing. If you are a money fund, you have so much money that the dealers just don't, don't need it. You have excess cash. There's wouldn't, nowhere to put wouldn't it. Wouldn't that make the... If there was excess cash in the normal repo market, wouldn't that make the repo rate go below the uh, the RRP the the repo rate with the Fed? So if you and have then there's an arbitrage there to keep it the, the oh, same, right? That's actually a, a really good question. So it, it the spread is really narrow. I I don't think people would would do that. So. If you are in the repo market as a participant, you are going to be a money market fund or you're going to be a dealer and you all have access to reverse repo facility. Mm -hmm. So you're never going to lend to someone less than it. If you're very unfortunate, you don't have access to it somehow. And let's say you're a small dealer or maybe a small money market fund and you're lending below, you're, you're right. In theory, someone could borrow that money and lend it into the RP. Um, I, I don't, I think that doesn't happen as much. It, it, it used to happen actually. So. There. So the federal home loan banks, for example, they have they, they don't have IOR, but they can access the RRP. Mm -hmm. Once upon a time, what they would do is they would they would actually issue debt at rates below the RRP, take that money and invest it in the RRP. That was the <laughs> arbitrage. <laughs> the regulars saw that and they got so mad <laughs> and they shut it down. Well, that's, you can't blame them. I mean, good. I, OK, if you're going to give me the reverse repo, Fed, we're going to use it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that that I so on the on the downside, yeah, that that definitely happens. Probably not as much though, because there's just not that many big players who don't have access to RP. Okay, so in practice, what happens effectively is yeah. uh, if there is too much liquidity or too many dollars, if you want to use that word, too much cash uh, in the normal repo market, then the Fed's reverse repo is just going to kind of suck that up. Yes. Therefore, the the repo rate in the normal market isn't really going to go beneath what the, no. the, the Fed's repo rate is because they're sucking up the excess liquidity. You can always lend to the Fed. You should, there's no reason why you wouldn't lend to lower. I mean, listen, it, it's doing, you have a good relationship with JPM. You, if, it's, if the rates are equal, you lend to them. But it's not, it's not so much of a good relationship that you would actually take a loss as in lend to them at a rate lower than the RP. So. Okay. Good. So I, I think we're we're pretty clear on. Did you have anything else to add in in thinking this? I just wanted to put our money market fund manager hat on to try yes. to view the world through their eyes, so we could start to understand kind of the rationale as to why we're seeing the the reverse repo as the Fed as the counterparty spike up to two point you know two point one trillion, and you just said that it's most likely going a lot higher. So uh, do you want to dive into that? And I think this yeah, gets into yeah. your most recent blog post, doesn't it? So, yeah. So again, George, like you were talking about, so money market fund looks around and looks for investments to invest in, right? What's happening is that the treasury is cutting bills and, you know, that's causing, I guess you could say some kind of a shortage maybe in, in things to invest in. And so what that means is that when they, all the bills that they bought in the past, all the agency uh, debt that they bought in the past, when that matures, they won't be rolling it back into bills and agency debt because the rates are so much lower than the reverse repo facility. So when it matures, what makes sense, the most sense for them is to roll it into the reverse repo facility. It's not just about rates as well, though. There's some optionality there. The money market, the reverse repo facility is overnight, right? So in case rates change in the future, you know, you can always take advantage of that. So you don't, you're not really there to take interest rate risk. So right. now you get something that takes, um, I mean, for example, rates can go higher or lower. So you don't, you're not really betting on whether or not the market is pricing in the Fed or not. But so you are getting basically high return and you're not taking up risk that, that you don't need. So it's an attractive investment. That's one thing. The other thing is, Let's say the market is correct and we get to, let's say, 3% RRP by the end of the year. If you are, you know, if you have money in the bank, why wouldn't you just put it in the RRP instead? So you could have a tremendous movement out of the banking sector into the RRP as well. 
So, you know, that's that's that that could be drawing money out of the bank system HRP. So you could easily get to three trillion. Now, is there because I, I was just briefly scanning this for the first paragraph of your uh of your article. And again, guys, this is at Joseph's website that you've got to check out. Incredible blog. It's free. It's just it's fedguy.com. So his most recent blog post is called Turbo Tightening. And so the, the first thing that you point out here, uh, I don't want to be redundant, but I, I think it's good that it's okay to review a little bit because this is some complex stuff here. Yeah. It, yeah. This is so good. you're saying a combination of increased money market fund allocation to reverse repo. NQT uh, is going to drain a trillion dollars of bank deposits out of the system by the end of the year. In other words, M2 money supply, the dollars on the balance sheets of the uh, of the the private sector uh, or the, maybe even the non-bank entities is going to decrease. And your argument there is because as the Fed does QT, that's going, those treasuries or mortgage-backed securities are going to be purchased by entities that have deposit accounts in the commercial banking system. Therefore, that'll be a swap of those deposits for the uh, treasuries or the collateral, or excuse me, the, the assets the uh, Fed is selling. And therefore, those bank deposit balances decrease and M2 decreases as well, which would go back to your turbo tightening. Do I have that right, Joseph? That's the QT part. In addition, you have the RP growing. That's also sucking money out of the banking system. So you have these two things happening. And I think the Fed did not anticipate the second one. If you listen to the Fed speeches, they're like, yeah, we can do QT. We can do QT really fast because we have a whole bunch of money in the reverse repo facility. <laughs> now, and they do, except that that whole bunch of money in the reverse repo facility is getting even bigger. So, you know, that I think that was completely unanticipated by them. So I'm not sure how they'll react. So I guess we'll find out. So uh, if our argument is on one hand, the Fed's doing quantitative tightening. Right. So that's reducing the, the balances in the deposit accounts of the, the, the entities, we'll say the non-bank entities. Would that decrease in aggregate total the amount of funds held with the money market funds, therefore less liquidity going into reverse repo? Um, that that that's another channel. So let's say that you're an investor and you buy one of these treasuries. Now you, you don't take money you hold held at a bank, but you take money that you were holding at a money market fund. Yeah, that's so basically what I'm saying. You withdraw money out of a money market fund. Yeah, totally possible. That's that that's totally a possible channel as well. So QT it has a lot of moving pieces, and that that is possible. And how exactly it'll play out, I, we'll, we'll find out um, just in a week and in, in the coming months as well. So. Yeah. So what's your uh, prediction there? I know, I know, you know, I was looking at the Fed's balance sheet yesterday and I don't know if it's updated in real time. I'm just going to the Fred website and it seems that it's leveled off and it's actually gone down slightly. So is this an indication that they're actually doing quantitative tightening or do I need to see a more significant move? Well, I think finally all the people on Twitter can stop talking about the but still increasing their balance sheet. So yeah, yeah no, no, I, I, yeah, I guess that that's happening. So uh, without looking at it deeply myself, it, it's hard to know. Um, if you're, when you're looking at, you're looking at total balance sheet size then? Yeah, I'm just looking yeah, okay. at yeah, total yeah. balance. So, it, it could, so I guess it could be anything because on their balance sheet, you've got, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the, the standing repo facility might uh, move it a little bit here and there. So, you know, it might go down because of these other things that are happening outside of quantitative easing or quantitative tightening. So yeah, without looking specifically at it, it's hard for me to, but, you know, if, if the timing looks like it could be the beginning of, of QT, although usually we, we have to wait until there's actual um, new treasury issuance. So, yeah, I'll, I, I, I uh, haven't looked into that yet. So what's your prediction for a quantitative tightening? And, and correct me if I'm wrong, for the viewers and listeners who don't know, you actually did a quantitative tightening the, the last time around. You were yeah. at the, the New York Fed's trading desk actually executing those trades. Yeah, so yeah. What are your, how are you looking at this round of quantitative tightening? How long do you think it will last? Uh, what do you think the, the Fed's 
main objectives are here. You know, and, and let me just give you kind of a hypothesis I, I'd love your opinion on. Uh, I, I've been thinking that, you know, that the Fed really can't raise rates too significantly because uh, of the debt in the, in the system and in the economy. And you'll notice, and I'm sure you've seen this, that every single time the Fed has raised rates, we've gone into a recession, it's been at increasingly lower rates. If that's the way to say it, uh, or the rates are always lower when that recession occurs. So we go back to 81, 18 percent, you know, 1990, let's say it was 9 percent, 2000, it was 5 percent, you know, so and so on. And so it seems like there's this trend that makes a lot of sense because the debt gets a lot higher where the Fed can, if they raised rates to 2.25 uh, percent last time. Uh, they'll only be able to raise it to maybe 1.5%. So they've got to figure out, okay, if we can only raise rates, let's say 150 basis points, how do we bring down CPI to a, a palatable level? Well, we can talk it down, or if there is a correlation between the Fed's balance sheet and the stock market, we can go ahead and uh, try to talk the, the asset prices down, reduce aggregate demand. We can do a little bit of QT to bring down asset prices as well. So we're trying to bring down inflation without raising interest rates. That, that's what my base case is. So uh, I guess, what do you think about that hypothesis? And then what is your opinion on what the Fed is doing, their rationale, and what they will do with quantitative tightening over the next six months? So I, I agree with your view, George. I think the Fed is trying to shrink the asset market a little bit as a way to tame inflation. So if you think back how Bernanke ran policy, he had something called the wealth effect, right? So he saw growth was low, inflation was low. So the way that he thought that people could get people to go spend is if he had a wealth effect, made your stock portfolio bigger, so then you can go and buy and spend stuff, right? Yeah. Now we have the opposite problem. We have too much of a wealth effect. People have a lot of money that they're spending everywhere. So one way to just take a little bit of that money out of the system is to just deflate the asset prices. And that, I think that's going to be kind of hard to do because if you look at what's happened the past two years, everything has gone up so much. If you own a home, right, your home prices are, your home is worth 30% more. Now that's a lot of extra spending power that people would make people go and, you know, buy stuff with. Stock market is much higher than it was pre-COVID. And so, and if you're into crypto, they're still higher than they were pre-COVID as well. So there's a lot of wealth out there that can be converted into demand. So the Fed can do something about that. Um, and with respect to the debt, I'm actually less worried about that. And so let's just talk about the private debt first. So there's a lot of debt in the system, of course. And if you raise rates, that's going to increase the payments of that. But if you, if you also see, though, that we're in an inflationary world, so revenues are going higher as well, right? So people are making more money. Corporations are making more profits. So you know, the cost of debt is going to go higher a bit, but, you know, the cost of everything for them is going higher. The cost of wages, um, the cost of, you know, say commodities and, and so forth. So it's another cost that's going higher. Um, so if CPI is higher than, let's say, the interest rates, that means real rates are negative. So it seems like the corporations and or whoever's borrowing all that debt uh, can handle it. Yeah, right? I, example, I worry about the consumer. You know, the, the consumer's balance sheet, because their incomes uh, don't go up uh, with the rate of inflation, you know, real incomes are, are decreasing, real wages decreasing. And if you combine that with increasing interest rates that they're having to absorb, not just when they buy a house or a car, but increasing rates that they're having to, to pay for, you know, that's a price, the price of money. So that yes. in a way will trickle through the entire economy. So that could put upward pressure, even more upward pressure on prices, which is, is pinching them, squeezing them even more, giving them less purchasing power, decreasing aggregate demand. So aggregate demand is, so aggregate demand is, a fun, is it's kind of a monetary thing, right? So, in, so supply is about producing goods and services. Demand is just monetary and that can come from income. So as you mentioned, real incomes are lower, so you could have less aggregate demand but it also comes from assets. So right. right now, overall, they still have a lot more assets, uh, have higher income as well. So I think the aggregate demand can be quite, can you know remain quite strong. And I think Jason Furman has made this point. Also, it's, it's a very good point. Fed has a job to do, just reduce that wealth effect, get 
aggregate demand lower. So th that seems to be what their plan. Um, that's that's how I see it playing out. So one of the, so one interesting point that I've heard from from Michael Cow is that he he shares your he shares your point that you know interest rates can't be raised too much, but there are other ways to go about doing this, and that is by steepening the curve, which is kind of what QT is, is trying to do. So maybe you can't raise your front end interest rates up to three, four percent. But let's say you let the long end go up. And the way that you do that is just from a very aggressive quantitative tightening. So yeah, but the problem know, is it's it's always been the opposite. When you look at the Fed's balance sheet, right? When the Fed is increasing the size of their balance sheet, you'd think extra demand for treasuries. Therefore, rates go, uh, you know, rates would go down. And then when they're doing quantitative tightening, less demand, you'd figure rates go up. But it, it, in the past, it's been the opposite. You know, when they actually do quantitative easing, increase their balance sheet, uh, rates actually go up. And then when they start doing quantitative tightening, the rates went down. So there is definitely a risk, risk, risk on, risk off sense in that. Let's say March 2020, huge risk off event. Everyone is buying treasuries and very scared. Fed does QE and, you know, well, maybe the world's not going to end. So, you know, rates go higher. But so there's a lot of things that go into determining what interests are. But yeah. I, I have to believe that if you buy $5 trillion of something, it, it has some effect on the price. So I think that this time, if you're looking at what's happening, though, at the announcement of QT, mortgage rates started. Oh, OK, so as we approached QT, mortgage rates started climbing notably. And that's yeah. kind of the impact of the Fed not buying agency MBS. And if you also note that, you know, the 10 year has been going steadily higher with well, above 3% today. Mm. And, you know, so QT does this time around seem to be doing what people logically think it would do. Right. And so, do you think, I'm sorry to cut you off there, but regarding mortgage rates, because I think that's a topic that is near and dear to almost everybody. Uh, the way I looked at it, it is it, with quantitative tightening is not only is there going to be less demand for these mortgage-backed securities, but is it true that the, the, the new market participants, excluding the Fed, because the Fed really doesn't care about making money or making a return, so they're not going to need a, uh, an additional interest rate for future inflation expectations or a risk premium. Maybe that's a better way to say it where if these mortgages are being absorbed by the private sector, now all of a sudden they're saying, okay, well, we need a risk premium because we actually have a p &L, uh, and we don't want to lose money. So sure, Fed, you can buy these at X price, but we're going to buy them at X minus Y. Therefore, the interest rate go up, goes up. Therefore, the new mortgages that are being created have to compete with those other mortgages, which brings those rates up. So even if the Fed doesn't, increase the fed funds just simply by doing qt and the market needing a risk premium you could see those mortgage rates rise or the 10-year i don't know if maybe the mortgage rates would rise even without the 10-year but what are your thoughts on that no th th that's exactly right so uh, the spread between the uh, let's let's say the fannie mays and the treasuries widened significantly uh, yeah in the one so exactly people need more of a premium exactly right so two things are happening here Tenure is going higher, and the spread that people want is also getting higher. So that's kind of a double whammy for, for mortgage rates. And so that's part of the reason why they've gone up so quickly. Do you think that spread will increase as the Fed does QT? I think so. I think so. Um, so I think it's hard for, for people to be able to price this right now. So because of the fact that there's just so much volatility and I think there's a chance that we're heading into just a fundamentally different inflationary regime. And if that's the case, you just can't count on Fed cutting rates really low and people refining. And if you can't count on that, then your cash flow estimates for your mortgages are fundamentally different. So usually people buy an agency MBS, they expect sometime down the line, Fed will cut down to zero, everyone refi, I'll get paid back immediately. Mm, so what's a What's a 30 year mortgage in practice is maybe going to get paid back in 10 years. And maybe I can't count on that anymore. You know, what if we are in a real inflationary regime shift where all these people who borrowed two and a half percent mortgages 
will never refi. Okay, so that that makes the mortgage, I think, a lot uh, cheaper. So it, it's not as good investment. So you, you're going to have to need a wider premium. So that's a great point. Yeah, I never thought of that, Joseph. Yeah. So yeah, I, I know we're running short on time, and I, I've got about a thousand more questions here, but you're going to be speaking at Rebel Capitalist Live, which I'm super excited about. And we're going to get you up there with Jeff Snyder. I know you guys had a discussion on, I think it was Blockworks. Yeah, was Blockworks. The, yep. the podcast? With, yeah. the, with Jack Farley, yeah. Yeah, in fact, I, I was really excited to listen to that. I actually tuned in live uh, <laughs> just so I could hear you guys go back and forth. It's just a fantastic uh, discussion that I really enjoyed. So hopefully we can have another one of those types of discussions with you and Jeff Snyder at Rebel Capitalist Live. But um, for my viewers and listeners who want to find out more about what you do, where can they go? So first of all, I'm really excited to be at Rebel Capitalist Live again. I'm looking forward to chatting with you and meeting the audience and uh, you know, just meeting everyone again. And if you guys are interested in my work, I have a blog, it's fedguy.com. And you can also follow me on Twitter, fedguy12. And if you're interested in the plumbing of the financial system, I have a book called Central Banking 101. It's available on amazon.com and it's been very well uh, received. So um, check it out. Yeah, and it's, do you have it there? Uh, not with you, not with me. At the oh, you got it. That, that's like yeah. book selling 101. Whenever I, talk I to, whenever I talk to Kiyosaki, you'll notice that's what he always does. Whenever I say something, he'll be, oh, it's just like the book I wrote. And then he'll like always do that. Like that, like every guy that sells books, they always have them like right there and they always hold them up when they talk about them. I think that's like the, the that's I got to like, learn from these guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's like selling books 101. That's the first thing, thing you learn in class. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Joseph, I look forward to seeing you in Miami, buddy. Thanks again for your time. Thanks. Look forward to it. Hello, fellow rebel capitalists. Do you enjoy watching these interviews I do for the rebel capitalist show? Well, if so, you would absolutely love rebel capitalist live. This is the conference I do twice per year. And we've had speakers like Robert Kiyosaki, Lynn Alden, Rick rule, Jeff Snyder, and Dr. Ron Paul just to name a few. So go to rebelcapitalistlive.com and check out the next event we have scheduled in Miami.